In the current video, we present the endoscopic endonasal transoculomotor triangle approach for resection of a pituitary adenoma with extension in the ambient cistern. The case refers to a 62-year-old female with baseline right-sided blindness after surgery when she was a child, who now presented with headaches and occasional blurred vision on the left. Imaging disclosed a large skull base mass. On physical examination, she was blind on the right with a leukocoria and she had slightly decreased visual acuity on the left. Formal ophthalmological evaluation revealed possible early optic neuropathy on the left. A preoperative pituitary panel revealed a mildly decreased 7 a.m. cortisol and a prolactin of 34. Imaging disclosed a contrast enhancing mass that expanded the pituitary fossa and extended into the clivus as well as the left ambient cistern to the left current sinus. The imaging characteristics were more consistent with a pituitary adenoma with right-sided displacement of the normal gland. It also appeared that the tumor was abutting the optic apparatus. The left ambient cistern component appeared to be more cystic. Given the headaches, as well as the early optic neuropathy, surgery was recommended. The endoscopic endonasal transoculomotor triangle approach was thought to be ideal for this tumor, as opposed to a combination of an endoscopic approach with an open approach. It's useful to review the anatomy of the oculomotor triangle, which constitutes the posterior roof of the cavernous sinus. The triangle is formed by three dural folds, the anterior petroclinoidal fold, the posterior petroclinoidal fold, and the interclinoidal fold. Notice that the course of the oculomotor nerve is lateral and roughly parallel to the interclinoidal fold. Studying the anatomy of the oculomotor triangle from an endonasal perspective, again we see the interclinoidal fold being medial and just parallel to the interdual segment of the oculomotor nerve. Removal of the oculomotor triangle in the posterior roof of the cavernous sinus provides wide exposure of the ambient cistern. These are our standard setup in the operating room with the patient supine and the head slightly turns towards the operating surgeons. The two monitors are placed ergonomically across each surgeon with the ENT surgeon placed at the top of the head. Here you can see the OR setup in a schematic with the two surgeons, the patient, the two monitors, neurophysiology, image guidance, and the scrap tech. After harvesting a nasoceptal flab and a white bony exposure, the paracellar and parclava choroid location is confirmed with Doppler ultrasound. We proceeded with debulking the cellar and clival component of the tumor, and subsequently the inferior compartment of the cavernous sinus. The abducens nerve, although not directly visualized, was stimulated inferior and lateral to a carotid. With continued debulking of the tumor, which now extended in the superior compartment of the cavernous sinus, we now look for the oculomotor nerve with EMG. Exposure of the roof of the cavernous sinus and early identification of the interclinoidal ligament allows for easier localization of the oculomotor nerve, which usually lies just lateral and parallel to the fold. In this still image, we again see the interclinoidal ligament running from posterior and medial to anterior and lateral, forming the anterior border of the posterior roof of the cavernous sinus. The oculomotor nerve enters through the posterior roof of the cavernous sinus, just lateral and roughly parallel to the interclinoidal ligament. Although following the surgical corridor created by the tumor is usually a safe strategy when this corridor is wide, in cases where the penetration of the cavernous roof is focal, such as in our case, good knowledge of the anatomy allows for anticipation and identification of critical neurovascular structures and avoidance of morbidity. In this still image, we again see the opening through the posterior roof of the cavernous sinus, which is otherwise known as the oculomotor triangle. This opening is developed between the interclinoidal ligament and the oculomotor nerve. Here, the surgical corridor is widened through the oculomotor triangle with exposure of the tumor within the ambient cistern and visualization of the medial temporal lobe. The origin of the superior cerebellar artery is identified with Doppler which lies right inferior to the 
oculomotor nerve. We subsequently proceed with short dissection of the tumor of the oculomotor nerve. This photograph illustrates the normal anatomical structures after the bulking of the tumor within the crural cistern. You can see the oculomotor nerve, which was displaced superiorly by the tumor, the mesiotemporal lobe, and the posterior communicating artery. After complete the dissection, the oculomotor nerve is again stimulated at low voltage to confirm its functional integrity. Final inspection of the ambient cistern with a 45 scope shows no evidence of gross residual tumor. Reconstruction was performed with Durogen, fat, surgices, and a nasoceptal flap. Surgicel, fibrin glue, gel foam, and mirror cells were used to secure our reconstruction. The patient had an un uncomplicated post-operative course and was discharged two days after the surgery. She had no evidence of oculomotor nerve dysfunction and neuro exam was as baseline. Given that she was given stress dose stairs perioperatively, she was discharged on a standing dose of hydrocortisone. Path was consistent with a pituitary adenoma with a low KI67. Re-evaluation of her pituitary axis at three months revealed no dysfunction and she was weaned off her steroids. Imaging at that time showed no evidence of residual tumor or recurrence.